positive things. Um, announcements. Saturday morning coffee, Moms with Kids with Disabilities. I'm going to have some flyers. All of this stuff is going to be on Facebook. It would be fabulous if you would start sharing that and we can start reaching those communities. Um, on October 28th, I am shutting down the garden, doing the cleaning the beams, um, windows, all of that kind of stuff. If anybody is available that day to help me, that would be fabulous because after that, we I will be getting ready for the bazaar. And so that is going to be a get things on the outside, inside kind of organized for the next, the next set of stuff that is coming our way. So I'm going to do that October 28th. So if you're available, that would be great. Men's card night is that evening. So um, looking at the calendar, we are packed with different events. We have high school kids using the place for their um, <coughs> projects, their, um, I want to call it a senior project, but it's not a senior project. Trinity, do you know what it is? <laughs> yeah, where they have to put, it's a class. Something like that. Anyway, I've got high school kids using the place to make meals for homeless people. I've got all kinds of stuff going, so I'm trying to throw, we're going to need to do some, like, clean the oven, clean the stove kind of stuff. So if you're available, men's card night. Caregiver's lunch is November 4th. I will have brochures and stuff out. If you know someone who is, takes care of, of other people, um, they are welcome to come that day, and we are going to serve them something. I don't know what yet. Um, save the date, December 9th, that is our Christmas Bazaar, that is our huge, huge fundraiser that gets us through the next year. So, if you have anyone that wants to donate baskets for the auction, or make some homemade goods to sell, or anything like that, we will take them. You're going to need to slide over because I think there's somebody new here. That we haven't seen oh, for a while. So Grandma. we need to slide over so she's got a place to sit, make room for our guests. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and so, uh, anyway, back to the bazaar. That's big. That is big for us. And last year, I we had several hundred people come through. <clears throat> uh, it was lots of fun. It's a big day. Um, that kind of stuff is going on. All right? So that's kind of my announcements for what's going on at Mary Mag. We are rolling and busy, and God keeps putting more stuff in front of us, and the discernment is happening as to what can we handle and what do we need to wait on. Um, but it's going well. This last week, I met with the ladies at Park Place. Um, it was super fun. It was a, a room full of 90-year-olds. And the question they asked was, what can we do to help Mary Mag? And I said, the best thing you can do to help Mary Mag is to pray for us and start connecting in your own communities because we are not the only ones that can battle the fight. And um, next thing I knew, I went from talking about jam ministries to lecturing a bunch of old ladies to get busy. It was great. <laughs> John goes, so do we have their support? I said, I don't know. I don't really know. But that, that's kind of the week in a wrap. Um, prayer, prayers. Um, Anne, our friend, is doing really well. Get ready to have her next um, cancer treatment. Uh, we have a guest in the house. Oh, wait, she's not a guest. She's just been gone a long time. Everybody clap for Sherman Clapp.
your smile and face. <laughs> yeah. No, it really is. <laughs> Don't shake it off. It really is good to see you. What else you got? Uh, just pray for my brother. He's still he's still out battling the addictions and that's quite a bit of brother. Well praise Jada, our daughter, <laughs> is out of treatment and appears to be, to the best of our knowledge, doing okay. So let's just pray that that continues. I'd like to lift praise of being back. And thank you all for your prayers while I've been gone. And then I have a couple of uh, great-grands in my family that need some extra prayers. The teenager, teenage boys having issues. Sometimes we just need to remind it that we aren't stuck in a season forever. And um, Lord, I just am thankful for the fall weather and the changing of the season. This is my favorite time of the year. Um, Lord, I, uh, I thank you for Mary Mag, and I thank you for the work that's being done here and the activities that are going on and all of the stuff and the people that are walking through our doors. Lord, I continue to pray for those who sign up. They know they want to come and they don't for whatever reason, whether it be fear or, you know, Satan throws busyness in their lives. Lord, I pray that they walk through the doors, Lord, and let us minister, minister to them. Lord, um, I lift up Anne as she continues to battle. Um, Lord, we lift up Andrea. Um, I don't know if today was her birthday or yesterday was her birthday, but Lord, I know that her son is going to see her for the first time. So, Lord, I just, since she had the accident. Lord, I just pray for that whole family. Lord, we lift up the Travis family and their grief. And Lord, we welcome back Shirley. Lord, what a praise it is to have her sitting within us in our group, Lord, and um, giving us her wisdom and her joy. And Lord, it makes my heart happy to see her. Lord, thank you so much for, for your healing power. Lord, we pray for Lexi's sister and her new placement. Lord, we pray that she finds a godly family that leads her straight to you. And Lord, we um, lift up Trinity and Logan's mom. Lord, we just pray that um, the voices in her head call, Lord, and that she can she can find you. And Lord, we pray for Sheldon's brother and addictions. Lord, we know too well that addictions are are so hard to fight. So Lord, I just pray that his addiction to whatever it is turn to an addiction to you. Um, Lord, I thank you that Jade is out of treatment. Lord, I pray that she can stay clean. Lord, that she can surround herself with people that, that love her and um, will guide her in the right direction. Uh, Lord, we lift up Shirley's grand and um, whatever issues they may have, Lord, you know, infiltrate people to help them. Lord, we thank you for Young, young Life and we thank you for the work that they do in this community. Lord, we pray for their banquet coming up and we pray for camp in two weeks, Lord, we pray that they can continue to make connections and have volunteers and all the stuff they need to eat needs so that they can impact our youth um, with a healthy dose of you. Lord, um, I pray for today. I pray for the message. I pray that uh, all the ins and the outs of Sunday go well. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Read somebody.
Old Testament reading comes from Psalms, chapter 80, verses 7 through 14. Restore us, O God of hosts, show the light of your countenance, and we shall be saved. You have brought a vine out of Egypt, you cast out the nations and planted it. You prepared the ground for it, it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered by its shadow, and the towering cedar trees by its boughs. You stretched out its tendrils to the sea and its branches to the river. Why have you broken down its wall? So that all who pass by pluck off its grapes? The wild boar of the forest has ravaged it, and the beasts of the field have grazed upon it. Turn now, O God of hosts, look down from heaven, behold and tend this vine, preserve what your right has planted. Today's New Testament reading comes from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 through 14. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of the Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this, nor that I have already reached the goal, but I press on to make my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this is one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. Press on towards the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let's confirm our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Travis Crow was a friend of quite a few of us in here, and uh, uh, obviously I knew him okay, didn't know him the greatest. Um, uh, Travis was a recovering addict. I just want to thank you for everybody here. And uh, just thank you that we got to have Travis for the moments that we did and for the lives that he touched, the people that he led to you, <laughs> for his excitement for you. He lived, lived like he was at a rock and roll concert and Jesus was the star. We pray this huge blessings and grace and peace over his home and his family. Pray for the days to come that they'll be able to find some comfort in you. Pray that you place people in their lives to rally around them. We pray for their finances in their home. Just thank you for the love that you exhibited through Travis. We're going to miss them. Pray for the recovery community. Loss is tough.
We just thank you for the, your reassurance that, the, that you're faithful to love to the end. Let's pray all that in Jesus' name. All right, sometimes at, uh, at funerals, you can, you got to stand up, you got to hug somebody and tell them you love them. So stand up, hug somebody and tell them you love them. Here, Brian, I love you. All right, love you. Love you. Love you. Love chapter 11. Now this is after uh, uh, the prophet Samuel had uh, told Saul that he was going to be king, had anointed him as king, gave him the three proofs that he would see on his journey back. He experienced all of those proofs. And so now everybody is kind of uh, uh, back uh, back to their houses, back to their, their territories, back to their tribes. Um, uh, and we pick up the story in, in 1 Samuel 11. It says, Now Nahash the Ammonite, is that a Jew or a non-Jew? Non-Jews. So this is enemy of the people. Now Nahash the Ammonite came up and besieged Jabesh Gilead. Now Jabesh Gilead is a town region. So if I said Hutchinson, Reno County, that's essentially the same as saying Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, make a covenant with us and we will serve you. In other words, the Jews that were trapped inside the city because they're besieging the city, so the army has surrounded itself around the city, and so the Jews want to make a covenant with him. In other words, let's make a deal. Nahash the Ammonite said to them, I will make one with you on this condition, that I will gouge out the right eye of every one of you, thus I will make it a reproach on all Israel. So yeah, let's make a deal, but I get to pop your eyeball out. The elders of Jabesh said, Let us alone for seven days, that we may send messengers throughout the territory of Israel, that if there is no one to deliver us, we will come out to you. Now, this is an interesting setup to what's about to happen next. So you got to picture the scene here. You're inside your village. I mean, these are this isn't Rome that he was surrounding, okay? I mean, it's a smaller area. Smaller walls, smaller gates, all of that kind of stuff. And the Ammonites come up and surround the city, besiege the city. And, and the elders within that city are like, hey, can, can we make a deal where there's no bloodshed? Yeah, but we get to, we get to cut out one of your eyes for every one of you. Now, that's, that's just picking a fight. I mean, that, that's not making a deal, right? That's, and so then they say, okay, give us one concession. If, if we can't make a deal, let our runners out so we can send runners to all over Israel to see if anybody will come help us. Now, what's interesting is that the Ammonite uh, uh, said, sure, go ahead and send a runner. Isn't that strange? I mean, from a military standpoint, you don't want to let the messages get out. That's such a strange uh, scenario. But nonetheless, that's what happened. So in, we, in verse 4, the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, where Saul was, who Saul King. He's a king. Why isn't he in the palace? They don't have one yet. All right. And they spoke these words in the hearing of the people, and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Now, behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen. And... Wasn't he the king? Coming from the field behind the oxen. I'm picturing Saul. Now, Saul's like 40 years old, you know. He's in his 
upper 30s, low 40s at this point. He's married, has kids, all of that kind of thing. But he's still working in the family business, which is ranching. And I'm picturing his dad saying, I don't care what the prophet said, you need to go do what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you know, uh, as long as you live in my house, we're going to, you know, all dads are the same. It doesn't matter. The messengers came to the day of Saul, spoke these words in the hearing of the people, and all the people lifted up their voices and wept. Behold, Saul was coming from the field behind the oxen, and he said, What's the matter with the people that they weep? So they related to him the words of the men of Jabesh. Verse 6, Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily when he heard these words, and he became very angry. I grew up in a church environment where anger was a sin. Where if you were angry, it was sinful. And I would have uh, uh, people that were way smarter than me in the faith that would say things like, you can't be angry, that's sinful. That's not what that says. There is such thing as a righteous anger. When our loved one ODs and they find his body, and he is a man of God and we recognize that he is, but the devil got him at the end. It's allowed to make you mad. It's allowed to. You're angry at evil. It's okay to be angry at evil. Saul was angry at evil. In verse 7 he says, It took a yoke of oxen, and he cut them in pieces, and sent them throughout the territory of Israel by the hand of the messenger, saying, Whoever does not come out after Saul, and after Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. Understand what just happened there. Saul's angry. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he's angry at evil. He's angry at this situation. He's angry that they would surround the city and say, yeah, we'll make a covenant with you, but we get to cut your eyeballs out. Yeah, send the runner. It isn't going to matter. The arrogance of it is under Saul's skin and it should be. To make sure that the rest of Israel understands what the king is requesting them to do. He doesn't write the message down on a piece of paper. He doesn't tell the runner what to say. He takes his oxen and cuts it into pieces. And he carves the message on the pieces and sends that. You guys have seen enough bad movies to know that when you get a finger in the mail, it means pay attention to this message. It's about blood. It's interesting, at the end of verse 7, it says, The dread of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out as one man. The dread of the Lord fell on the people, and they came out as one man. It means that they all rallied. It means that they all felt the conviction of that moment, and they were all in. You guys have experienced that. You guys have been in situations where you just felt and you will step up and do whatever it is the Lord wants you to do. You guys have felt that. That's what's going on right here in a huge corporate type set. They came out as one man. In verse 8, he numbered them. Saul numbered them in Bezek. Bezek is a place. And the sons of Israel were 300,000 and the men of Judah 30,000. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. They said to the messengers who had come, Thus you shall say to the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you will have deliverance. So the messengers went and told the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Then the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. Now, this is a little confusing. Let me clear this up. So in verse eight or in verse 9, the messengers that came to the village where Saul was... Um, um, they're still, now the army has gathered, right? And then here's Saul, and Saul sends those messengers back to their elders in the village of Jabesh Gilead that's surrounded. Tell them that by the time the sun's up and it's hot, you'll have your freedom. Does that make sense? So, the enemy let the messengers out, but also let the messengers back in. So then in verse 10, the men of Jabesh said, to who? To the Ammonites. 
All right, so now the messengers come back from King Saul, talk to them, and they send a message out to the people that are besieging the city. And the message is this, tomorrow we will come out to you and you may do to us whatever seems good to you. Do you see the deception in that? You recognize it's a ruse. Okay, so they're saying, hey, we sent out our messengers and nobody's coming to help. So tomorrow we'll come out and cut out our eyes, whatever, whatever you got to do. That's what they tell the enemy. But pastor, that's lying. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Sometimes you got to be as crafty as serpents. Evil's evil. Evil don't get good. Right? Now, there are rules that we have to play by when we're dealing with our enemy. Knowing that our enemy is not going to play by any kind of rule. Now, Christianity is not into moral victories. <coughs> moral victories hurt just as much as the losses do. The only way that you can fight evil is on your knees. It's the only way you can fight evil. You pray and you pray and you pray. And you hurt and you hurt and you hurt. And you cry out and you cry out and you cry out. That's okay. That's what you do with your anger. The men that are surrounding the city that are arrogant enough to suggest we'll let you send for help knowing it won't matter. We're going to cut your eyeballs out. I'm not going to hold the men of Jabeth Gilead responsible for a ruse. For saying, hey, tomorrow we're going to come out and you can do whatever you want. I'm not going to hold them responsible for that. Verse 11, next morning Saul put the people in three companies. And they came into the midst of the camp at the morning watch and they struck down the Ammonites until the heat of the day. Those who survived were scattered so that no two of them were left together. In other words, it was a rout. It was a rout. When the people said to Samuel, Who is he that said, quote, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring the men, that we may put them to death. Now, we've got to backtrack just, just a little bit. So at the end of chapter 10, when Saul had been chosen king, and the men were going back to their houses, it says in verse 26 and 27, Saul went to his house in Gibeah, and the valiant men whose hearts God had touched went with him. These were the bodyguards. In verse 27, but certain worthless men said, how can this one deliver us? And they despised him and did not bring him any present. But he kept silent. Saul kept silent. Saul knew there was dissenters, and he kept silent. So this is coming full circle back to that, hey, where are all those people who didn't think he could be the king now? That's what's happening. And Saul says, verse 13, not a man shall be put to death this day. For today the Lord has accomplished deliverance in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, come and let us go to Gilgah and renew the kingdom there. Now, this is where the prophet enters back in. So Samuel is the one who says, let us go back to Gilgah. Uh, um, and they offered sacrifices of peace offerings before the Lord. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. So here's my question. How did Israel celebrate the victory over the Ammonites? Offering sacrifices. They offered sacrifices unto the Lord. Is that okay? Is that okay to do? Of course it is. They prayed to the Lord. How do we do it? And the Lord said, do it. And then celebrate. Celebrate back to the Lord. Um, you know, society isn't society and then our relationship with God. You know, it isn't like, here's the culture, here's what I do all the time, and then here's my relationship with the Lord. They should be the same thing. Does that make sense? If your team wins the game on Friday night, you ought to th thank you, Lord. Yeah. If you lose the game on Friday night, it should still be, thank you, Lord. God should be included in whatever it is we got going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sheldon, did you find the deer? 
Still praise the Lord, though, right? Involve the Lord with whatever it is that's going on. In chapter 12, Samuel says to Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice and all that you said to me, and I have appointed a king over you. Now, here is the king walking before you. I'm old and gray, and behold, my sons are with you, and you know they're worthless. We covered that in another verse uh, a couple weeks ago. And I have walked before you from my youth even to this day. Here I am, bear witness against me before the Lord and his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Whose hand have I taken a bribe to blind my eyes with? I will restore it to you. Who? And they said, you have not defrauded us or oppressed us or taken anything from any man's hand. So Samuel says back to them, the Lord is witness against you and his anointed is witness this day that you have found nothing in my hand. In other words, Samuel's saying, are you sure? We've got no problem. I've never done anything wrong, never did you guys, I've served you faithfully my whole life. Yes? Yes? And they're like, yes. And he says, he is witness. It's interesting that Samuel feels like he has to do this. This is Samuel setting the context for what he's going to say next. In other words, Samuel's saying, hey, I've never done you wrong, right? Right. I've never done you wrong, right? I've never lied to you, right? I've always been with you, right? I've always served you, right? Now listen to what I'm going to say. Because I'm saying this from that place of everything is about serving you. It's about helping you. It's about leading you. I got no self in this. That's the context that he said it. <laughs> So he says in verse 6, Samuel said to the people, It is the Lord who appointed Moses and Aaron who brought your fathers up from the land of Egypt. Now, I can already see the eye roll of the people that were listening to that. Because anytime the prophet speaks and he starts with that, he knows there's a, they know there's a speech coming, and it's usually not good for the people that are listening. So anytime the prophet says, now you remember, Lord was the one who took out Egypt. Oh, here we go. It's the Egypt thing. All right? So that's what started in his verse 70. So, so now take your stand that I may plead with you before the Lord concerning all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did for you and your fathers. When Jacob went into Egypt and your fathers cried out to the Lord, the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, who brought your fathers out of Egypt and settled them in this place. But... They forgot the Lord their God, so he sold them into the hand of Sisera, <clears throat> excuse me, captain of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. They cried out to the Lord and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and have served the Baals and the Ashtarah, but deliver us from the hands of our enemies and we will serve you. Then the Lord sent Jeroboam, beaten Jephthah, and Samuel, and delivered you from the hands of your enemies all around so that you lived in security. Have we read this story before? Bo, you and I laugh about this all the time. We've read this story before. All right? God's people messes up. They start to live like not God's people, start to serve other gods. They get oppressed. They get taken into captivity. Bad stuff happens. They cry out, Lord, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry. Send us a deliverer. The Lord feels sorry for him. Sends him a deliverer. Takes him out of captivity. And the cycle starts over again. It happens again and again and again and again. So why would Samuel bring all this up? First Samuel says, hey, I've never lied to you, right? Remember this. This is the cycle. This is the cycle of life between God's people and God. And then he says this. Then he says this in verse 12. When you saw that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, and you said, No, but a king shall reign over us, although the Lord God was your king. Now, therefore, here is the king whom you have chosen, whom you have asked for, and behold, the Lord has sent a king over you. And then in verse 14, he says, if you will fear the Lord and serve him and listen to his voice and not rebel against the command of the Lord, 
then both you and also the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. Look at that again. He says, if you fear the Lord, then both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord. One more time. If you will fear the Lord. Who's you? The people, not the king. If you, the people, fear the Lord and serve him, listen to his voice, don't rebel, then both you and the king will follow the Lord your God. 15. If you will not listen to the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the command of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you as it was against your fathers. What Samuel is saying is, it doesn't have to be this cycle. It doesn't have to be this. If you will serve the Lord, it's going to work. If you don't serve the Lord, it's not going to work. It's very fascinating to me that the success or the failure of King Saul is dependent upon the people. It's not dependent upon Saul. It's fascinating. Because King Saul is the guy who gets drugged through the mud all the way through Bible history. He's always the one to get, he's the setup for King David who's a man after God's own heart. So King Saul just gets drugged through the mud, drugged through the mud, drugged through the mud. But this seems to suggest that King Saul could have been successful if the people were in it. Um, I'm not saying that King Saul doesn't have free will or doesn't have choice or doesn't have... I'm not saying that he doesn't have any ante up to this. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that, that by and large, the leaders of countries, whether they be kings, whether they be presidents, whether they be emperors, when you look at their character, most often the character is representative of the people that they lead. If we want better leaders, we need to be better people. Does that make sense? God puts a responsibility on us. So verse 16, Samuel's still speaking. He says, even now take your stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do. Is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to the Lord that he may send thunder and rain, that you will know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to the Lord, and the Lord sent thunder and rain that day, and the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. So, wheat harvest. It, it's dry when they harvest wheat. It's, it's wetter when they plant wheat to get the moisture into the ground uh, initially. I know Kansas takes all these things and flips it on its head an awful lot of times. But it, it's wheat harvest today, meaning it's dry. You don't expect rain. So it would be more miraculous to have rain today than it would be when they planted. Do you understand that, how, how that's supposed to work? So why is it necessary for Samuel to say, I'm going to ask the Lord to send thunder and rain so that you'll believe what I'm saying? Remember, he started with, have I ever lied to you? No. Everything that I've done has been for the benefit of, of, of us as people, right? Yes. I, if the Lord tells me, I tell you. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. This is on you. You want this whole king experiment to be successful? That's on you. Don't believe me? You think I'm just telling you this? Okay. Lord, set thunder and rain during the dry season in such a way that they know this is carrying the weight of the heavens. Samuel was dead serious about them getting this message. Getting this message. In verse 19, all the people said to Samuel, pray for your servants to the Lord your God so that we may not die. 
For we have added to all our sins this evil by asking for ourselves a king. Did they get the message that asking for a king wasn't a good idea? They got the message, right? Now, it may have took Samuel saying, I'm never lying to you. It may have took thunder and lightning. It may have took all of these things. Who's hearing this? So, the king. <clears throat> what does that do to you psychologically? You know how awful that would be? Why was Saul made king? Because God wanted the people that understand how much they need him and not a king. Yes. But why Saul? Because he was the least of all of them. He was head and shoulders taller than everybody else. He looked the part. Looked good. Looked good. How, how did the prophet find Saul? Saul's just looking for donkeys. Remember? Saul's on task. Where are these donkeys at? Wandering around looking for donkeys. Next thing you know, he finds a kingdom. A kingdom with no palace. A kingdom with no infrastructure. The Lord changes his heart, prepares him up. But he still has got to hear it's evil that we're even doing this, but good luck. It's an awful way to start a job. <laughs> Samuel says in verse 20, Do not fear... You have committed all this evil. Now, I'm going to pause. I know there's a comma. That's not a period. But let's just dwell on that for a minute. The prophet says, do not fear. You have committed all this evil. It sounds like when you're in confession. Do not fear. You have committed all this evil. Yet there's still forgiveness for you. It says, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. What is the lesson from that? You can, you can come back from it. Yeah, mercy. You can come back from it. But, Pastor, you don't know I did. I don't care what you did. You can come back from it. Pastor, you don't know what I'm addicted to. I don't care what it is. You can come back from it. You don't know how I'm afflicted. I don't care what your affliction is. I don't care how bad you feel. You can come back from it. Why? Because that's what God does. We're not capable, but God is. But God is. Samuel's saying, yes, you messed up. Yes, you messed up. You offended God when you said, we don't want you to be king. We want somebody else to be king so that we can look like all of the other nations that you're trying to separate us from. We want to look just like them. You've heard it say that when the church looks like the culture that the church is losing, I relish the fact that we're weird. I'm okay with that. When people come here and visit, I want them to leave and say, those folks are weird, and I don't know that I believe, but they believe it. They believe it. They pray hard. They laugh hard. They cry hard. They sing hard. They worship hard. Our society needs that. It needs the Christian to be Christian. Stop being Republican. Stop being Democrat. Stop being American. Be Christian. Yes. Be Christian. All the rest of that stuff is secondary. You must not turn aside, he says, for then you would go after futile things which cannot profit or deliver because they are futile. But John, this election is important. It's futile. <clears throat> John, I, I, this back, it, it's futile. Seek the Lord first. 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 If God loves you, he's going to have room in your life for you to go do this thing. To go uh, 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 be involved with school boards and whatever else. It doesn't mean you can't do those things. It's just they can't be first. They have to be second, third, fourth, fifth. Does that make sense? Verse 22, the Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. The Lord will not abandon his people on account of his great name, 
because the Lord has been pleased to make you a people for himself. Do you believe that to be true? Yes. Do we, are, are we part of the people that he has created for himself? Yes. So what does that say about God? He will what? Not, not, not abandon saying. us, right? Is that a promise? Yes. yes. Verse 23, as for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Now, this is Samuel the prophet talking about the people he just said were evil, yet there was still hope for them. He says, I'm not going to sin against the Lord. I'm going to keep praying for you. Far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider what great things he has done for you. But if you still do wickedly, both you and your king will be swept away. Okay, so in verse 22, it says the Lord will not abandon you. And in verse 25, it says, but if you still do wickedly, you and your king will be swept away. Isn't that abandoned? It's, it's not abandoned. It's discipline. But it's also, I love you enough to let you choose. I love you enough to let you choose. So, <clears throat> it, so in verse 14, still in chapter 12, so in verse 14 we have, if you will fear the Lord and serve him, then both you and the king will be successful. And we compare that to verse 25. But if you do wickedly, you and your king will be swept away. It's the same statement. Right? It's the same statement. One side is saying, if you do it right, it's going to be great. The other side is saying, if you do it wrong, it's going to be awful. It's still if, then. If, then. It's cause and effect. Don't we believe that in everything else that we do? No matter how often I can pray for the cheese curl to actually be a carrot. It's a cheese curl. It's going to affect me this way. There's cause and there's effect to everything that we do. The consequences of life is life. You make this choice, there's consequences. You make that choice, there's consequences. Good or bad. It's the way it works. If, then, then. If, then, then. That is still applicable to us, right? Yes. I mean, we're not exempt from that. I mean, King Saul's not our king. So, in America, 2023... Is, is this applicable? Is our leadership based off of us? I got some people in here right now going, wait a minute, man, I ain't got nothing to do with Biden. <laughs> <laughs> I got some people in here right now going, wait, wait a minute, I got nothing to do with Trump. <laughs> what I'm saying is they are reflections of who we are. If America needs to put America in the eye, it has to start small rooms like this. Now, I say, your priority is to be a Christian first. Now, I would challenge you to read through the book of Acts. Chapter 1 all the way through the end. And you find in there where the disciples learned how to be nation builders. Were, were you, and then read through the Gospels. And try to find a spot where Jesus taught them how to be kings and presidents and, and, and put people on thrones and control them from the side. And you find where those lessons are. Because they ain't in there. What Jesus taught his disciples is, you go be a Christian, despite what that madness is. Some of the finest Christians survived Nazi Germany. Their leadership was Hitler. They wrote some of the finest books on discipleship I've ever read. The fastest growing church in the world is in China. And they're oppressed. 
this, this, this grasp that we have about religious freedom. Well, I want to live in a country where uh, freedom. Don't focus on that. Focus on Christ. Focus on Jesus. How is Jesus moving in your life? What is he, what is he uh, 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 loving you into to help with your neighbor, with your family member, with your co-worker, with your whatever? How are you serving the crown? How are you serving the throne? How are you doing it? Are you asking for directions? How are you, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. doesn't matter who's in the State House. doesn't matter. doesn't matter what country you're in. doesn't matter what color you are. doesn't matter what language you speak. It don't matter. Do what we're supposed to do. Because our kings, presidents, and emperors are going to be successful if we're successful. Our countries will be successful if we're successful. What does success look like? Love, joy, peace. That's what it looks like. We have to redefine it because Satan's been really good at making us think it means something different. Lord, I love you. <clears throat> Lord, I pray for the still-suffering addict this morning. Lord, I pray for the still-suffering church. Lord, I pray for all of us that have a desire in our heart to serve you, and we're just confused. We don't know how. We feel like we can't get out of our own way. Lord, I pray that you would take that desire within us and you would, you would have it build. And then you would provide a, a, a enough clarity that we could take the first step and then give us the courage to take the step and to let you be God. Lord, the whole King Saul message it, it makes me hurt because I oftentimes feel like he didn't have a chance. And Lord, I know so much of us feel the same way. Lord, you're an amazing and awesome God. And our struggle to understand you will be a lifelong struggle. Lord, I am thankful that you are God and there is no other. I'm thankful there aren't competing gods, a good, bad, and a bad God. I'm glad there's just God. It's just you, Father, Son, Spirit. And you're for us, and you're with us, and you love us. Lord, I pray that we would walk our path, that you would make it apparent to us what it is. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>
Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to give him thanks and praise. So we join the angels, the archangels, the whole host of heaven, the whole company that has moved on before us. Joint Travis, and so many others. As we say and sing these words, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All praise and glory is yours, Lord, for in your tender mercy. He gave your only son, Jesus, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption. And he made there by his one oblation of himself a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice for the sins of me, and you, and the whole world. And he instituted in his holy gospel, and he commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of his precious death and his sacrifice until he comes again. So now, Lord. In your great goodness, we ask you to bless and to sanctify with your word and Holy Spirit these gifts of bread and wine, Lord. I pray that you would take these normal, everyday, natural things and turn them into wild, crazy, supernatural things. Lord, may they become the blood and the body of Christ. that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body. It's broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And after the supper, Jesus took the cup and again, giving thanks, he said, this is my blood. This is the blood of the new covenant. It's the blood that forgives sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance. screens and wouldn't have words on screen, wouldn't have music like that, wouldn't have cars pulling in parking lots. Just the, the way it would have worked logistically would have been so much different. But from the moment the church was formed until now, when the blood and the body is presented, it's the link that links us all together. And that link is Christ. It isn't denominational signs. It isn't the, the crosses on top of building or the lack of crosses on top of building. It's Jesus is the link. Therefore, Lord, our Heavenly Father, According to the institution of your dearly beloved Son, where we remember his blessed passion, his precious death, his mighty resurrection, his glorious ascension, and his promise to come again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Lord, we ask through your fatherly goodness, Lord, that you would mercifully accept this as our sacrifice of praise. We ask that you grant by the merits and the death of your son Jesus and by faith in his blood that we, your whole church, may obtain forgiveness of our sins and all the other benefits 
<coughs> of his past. Lord, I confess. Lord, I confess that I have sinned against you. That I have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. In thought, word, and deed. By what I have done. What I have done. What I have left undone. What I have left undone. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. Lord, for these things I am sorry. Lord, for these things I am sorry. I humbly repent. I humbly repent. For the sake of your son Jesus. For the sake of your son Jesus. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please have mercy upon me. Please have mercy upon me. That I may delight in your will. That I may delight in your will. Walk in your way. Walk in your way. Bring glory to your name. Bring glory to your name. Although we are unworthy, Lord, because of our many sins, to offer you any sacrifice, any at all, we ask that you would accept this duty and this service that we owe, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ, our Lord, by him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, I pray you would unite the church. Lord, I pray that in this time and climate with wars and the Holy Land and all over the place, that you would unite the church. Lord, that you would call upon that link that is Jesus, the link that unites us all. Lord, I pray that we will be united with the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done.
on October 29th, we're going to celebrate All Saints Day. Um, and uh, those of you who haven't celebrated that with us, that's what the ribbons are about here. So we, uh, we commemorate somebody who's important to us in our life who has passed on uh, with, with the faith. And so we write their name down. They're, they're part of the great cloud of witnesses. It's just a visual reminder that the church is always with you even after they pass on. Okay, that, that's all the hoo that we get with that. Um, I'm not going to do a sermon that day. We're going to do testimonies. Uh, I want to hear what God is doing in your life. Now, I'm calling those ALSRs, all right? So they're after lightning strike reports, all right? So they're not testimonies. They're ALSRs. And so I want to hear your ALSR. Uh, give me a heads up. If you want to do, I need to know if we're going to have two people or 20. All right. Um, so, that doesn't work. I'm trying to give you my phone number. 4740804. Oh, uh, if you don't have it, that's it. Uh, shoot me a text and say, hey, I want to do a testimony. Oh, I'm sorry. I gotta get the get the lingo down too. An ALSR, right? And um, and we will we will get you scheduled. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, uh, some of you, and I'm giving you fair warning here, because this is how this is how God and the devil work. All right, you're gonna get an initial. I have something to say. If you do, you're gonna have initial. I have something to say, and the devil's got two weeks to convince you not to say. All right. I'm telling you that friction that you feel is completely normal. Completely normal. Pray your way through it. Have the courage to step out. Uh, this is the most forgiving crowd you will ever speak in front of. Amen? Amen. 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 All right, let's get our blessing. <laughs> May God bless us with discomfort and the easy answers, the half-truths, and the superficial relationships of this world so that we may live deep within our heart where the Holy Spirit dwells. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for and pray for justice, freedom, and everlasting peace. May God bless us with tears for those that suffer pain rejection, addiction, hunger, war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them, to turn their pain to joy. May God bless us with enough foolishness to actually believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice, kindness, love, joy, peace, to bring Jesus to the world. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all and bring this to pass. Amen. 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 Would you please stand? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Travis Crow family, we pray for mama, daughter, and son, and all of those involved. And uh, Lord, evil really aggravates us. Uh, Lord, may we stay aggravated with evil and dig in. May we pray, may we pray, may we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.